Welcome Team Rhino. We are celebrating World Rhino Day today by talking with experts from around the world on subjects on a variety of rhino conservation topics. Joining me is Ed Sayer, project leader for Frankfurt Zoological Society's North Luanga Conservation Program in Zambia. Welcome Ed and thank you for joining me today. Uh, thanks Chris, thanks for uh, inviting me to, to join this. I look forward to having a chat. Great. Can you tell me a little bit more about the, your background in the North Luanga Conservation Program? Um, yes, yeah, so North Luanga Conservation Program is, what, 34 years old this year. Um, it's been basically the project took over uh, the support of the North Luanga ecosystem in the mid 80s um, and has evolved through a number of kind of forms, but the last 20 uh, 20 odd years, it's um, morphed um, up a level um, with the Rhino project having been initiated in uh, 2001. And then between 2003 and 2010 was a period of reintroduction of a new founder population because Zambia had uh, lost all of its rhinos. Um, and then since 2010, we've kind of evolved into a uh, a, a more typical rhino project in terms of managing a, uh, a population and the uh, challenges that come with that, especially in light of the recent um, threats that have developed. Um, but also we've kind of um, developed the project using the rhino as a flagship to be able to spread out or to leverage funds and support and messaging across a much wider area, 22,000 square kilometers. So that's What's that like? That's the same size as New Hampshire uh, as a state in the US or the same size as Wales as a country. So it's a big area. Um, and uh, the Rhino have enabled us to, 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 to leverage support and to, to reach, you know, uh, very different sectors of society and the community from schools through to clinics, through to microfinance groups, gender equality groups, as well as scouts as well as you know the wildlife um the, the direct wildlife um based activities within the area so you live in the park uh can you describe the park and what it's like to live there yeah that's no, it's a good place we live in the middle of the park um we have our main operation space in the center um yeah that's no, a good place to live i mean it's very remote i guess um in the modern world it's a bit like living in permanent um lockdown or isolation um because <laughs> around there um, so we're kind of quite used to this scenario um, but it's um, yeah it's great I mean, we live in the middle of the rhino sanctuary so we can get anything coming through our area um, or our garden whether it's uh, rhinos whether it's elephants lions leopards you name it um, so it's a good place to be very good place to be good place to raise children we're lucky enough to have three kids and they've grown up there for the first 10 years of their lives so far um, and yeah, obviously subjected to pretty harsh seasons in terms of a very wet rainy season and then a very hot and very dry, dry season. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's a lovely place to wake up to, um, you know, day to day life is pretty, pretty much similar to everybody's behind a laptop, behind, um, emails and what have you, but, um, it's a great place to be able to switch off every now and again and to get out into the, into the bush. It sounds amazing. So uh, you mentioned the park is home to uh, black rhinos um, and you told us a little bit about the history of uh, rhinos in Zambia. Could you take us into a little bit more detail on um, why the population was lost and, and how the reintroduction went and uh, what the trends are today? Yeah, so I think to, Zambia had one of the largest black rhino populations on the continent historically and then through the 70s and 80s, um, they were wiped out. Um, and declared extinct in the 90s, but I mean, down to negligible numbers from the mid 80s onwards, which is a, which is a great shame because that's a huge number of rhinos to be approached. You're talking between eight and 12,000, I think, across the country. Um, and that's a huge number to go. You know, bearing in mind, if you think about Zambia now, if anybody, if any of our listeners know Zambia, you know, that's not far off the number of elephants there are today. Um, and you see elephants in quite a lot of places. Um, to think that that got down to zero is, you know, that's a very effective um, and ruthless poaching um, period that went on. So, you know, there's a lot of uh, rebuilding had to be done of, of the kind of management infrastructure um, across the ecosystem, across the project to be able to consider 
bringing black rhinos in and a very ambitious project that was started um, by our predecessors um, in, the, in the park, um, late 90s, early 2000s to get that going. Um, as it hadn't really at that stage been done you know, to that level in many other places um, in Africa and especially not to an area that had lost its entire population. So there was, you know, there's a certain amounts of uh, confidence building that was needed. So, you know, a number of doubters, I think. Um, but, you know, the original plan was to bring in, I think, 25 straight away, but plans and reality often don't marry up and uh, end up being 25 animals spread over seven years, which is not ideal in any, uh, in any situation, because you really want to bring them in as, as quickly as possible in one group so that you can reduce that social uh, adaptation or getting to know each other phase, um, and getting to know the area. So, so that wasn't a deal. So there were quite a few ups and downs, but as with anything, there's a lot of politics involved with getting rhinos um, out of one country and into another. So you know, that's just a reality, and it, it took seven years to bring them in. Um, with hiccups along the way, whether induced by social or nutritional issues or adaptation issues, getting, getting used to the new place. Um, but, you know, since 2011 onwards, um, you know, the, the population has done really well and is now growing at a good rate, very good rate. Um, lots of calves around um, and we've had to expand the, the rhino sanctuary or fenced area. Um, and, um, and consolidating our management of those animals. Obviously, we've gone from different phases of rhino conservation in the last 10, 15 years as well. We've gone from a phase of there being very little rhino poaching to the crisis years um, that we've seen in the last, um, what, five, six, seven, eight years with the, with the poaching really picking up. Um, we've fenced the rhinos, we've taken the fences down, we've put the fences back up. Um, because of all these issues, we've employed many more scouts, really invested in law enforcement, equipment, training, strategies, what have you. Um, and now I suspect, you know, the reality is the, the, the threats that we are designing on building and training our teams to cope with are probably here to stay. I don't think there's going to be a decline from this level of threat now. I think this is where we're at. This is the future. Um, and so, you know, it's now a matter of... Uh, finding a way to ensure that we can sustain this level of effort, to sustain this level of protection, effort and management um, in the long term. Um, at the same time, trying to think of areas, what else can we do you know, with a growing population? What else can we do for Zambia, for black rhino and Zambia in general? So we've got a few ideas um, afoot there. Um, but yeah, I mean, that, that, that's pretty much the update of where we are with the rhinos at the moment. So, um... It seems like you, you know, you, you've come through a bad period. Um, there are significant threats, including poaching and, um, well, I guess you have some, some habitat decisions to make as well, which is, which is always a, um, usually a good, a good uh, um, problem to have, um, but one that's uh, difficult to solve often. Um, are there any other threats that they face? And uh, what are some of the ways that you're overcoming uh, some of these challenges? I think the biggest threat really is going to be um, partnerships um, because the success of any conservation, I think projects or conservation areas now across the world, um, but also obviously in Africa and especially in Zambia, is based on partnerships. And that's partnerships between the community in the area, um, the government or the, the government departments that are mandated to, to, to govern these kind of situations. And then the, the private sector, whether the private sector is an NGO or whether it's a private investor, philanthropic or, or whatever. Um, you know, there's uh, no one, no one organisation can um, manage these large landscapes, can manage these, these uh, uh, rhino or, 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 or high value species um, conservation efforts. It has to be a consortium of partners and those partners have to be able to work on a within relationship based on trust and transparency with good relationships. Um, and that's obviously, you know, that, that comes with a number of different phases. You know, that's at a local level, hands-on implementing level, as well as, you know, climbing the ranks up through ministries, up through to the higher um, levels of government. Um, and, um, you know, it's absolutely key that those relationships are strong, 
Um, you know, there are ups and downs, of course there are. But as long as there is, um, you know, trust and understanding, I think that's probably the biggest, the biggest challenge at the moment. Um, be second to that, I think, and, but, but, but very much linked to that. And that's because, and I mentioned community is one of those key partners, is, you know, I think the future of these areas um, is incorporating inclusivity of communities, um, whether that's in decision making, uh, in some form of ownership, or some form of um, appreciation or value um, um, of wildlife in their area, living with wildlife. I mean, these are the same people living with a huge amount of human wildlife conflict. They're the same people that are you know, trying to support revenue um, generation of wildlife-based enterprises, activities, whether it's hunting, whether it's photographic, whatever it is, whether it's forestry management, fishery management. Um, so there needs to be returns. There needs to, it doesn't, I'm not saying it needs to pay for themselves, there, do, there does need to be returns, there has to be value there. Um, I say it doesn't need to pay for itself, I mean the cost of high level, high value species protection far exceeds anything that can be generated from, from a business at the moment and therefore we are looking for a global um, responsibility and global support for these large protected areas. But that's, you know, that's easily justified because in landscapes like North Orangra, which are 22,000 square kilometers, I mean they are vital alveoli of the world's lungs. And of course the world needs to, or the global community needs to chip in. Um, and that lends itself back to the idea of the partnerships because you know, one, no one single, no single one organization or single country can front up and um, meet these challenges. It has to be um, a consortium or a group of, of, of partners together doing this. Um, and so I think people is the next biggest thing after the partnerships is people. Um, and that's primarily the communities that are adjacent to these areas or within some of these conservation areas. Um, and, you know, the, the next one is, 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 the, is the physical place as well. So the encroachment beyond these areas, um, whether through charcoal or farming conversion or, 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 or um, other forms of um, habitat loss are what is the next biggest challenge. Um, and that's obviously being driven by population growth uh, through poverty in certain areas, um, and I think you know the, the 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 focus needs to be on protecting these wider areas, not just your IPZ or your intensive protection area around the rhinos or rhino sanctuary. It goes way beyond that, uh, because you know by the time you're looking at a a front line, should we say, between the non wildlife areas and the rhino area being a fence, then it makes life very difficult indeed. So we really need to try and focus as much as we can at the moment on those wider buffer areas beyond the park or beyond the rhino sanctuary um, to be able to, to create a, a, a safe and secure core. Mm, yeah, that, that makes a, a lot of sense that it's taking the, the bigger picture and it, it seems to be a theme on uh, um, many people that I've spoken to recently. Um, you know, it's not, it's not a matter of, you know, restri restricting uh, things, but actually working in partnership so that everybody benefits. So um, let's turn to uh, how has uh, the COVID-19 pandemic um, that's uh, hit us uh, globally, has that had an impact on Zambia and uh, any impact on um, current activities in the park? Um, well, on the current activities in the park, um, the answer right now is no. Um, it hasn't had an impact now, today. Um, and that's because we haven't seen a surge of cases um, and people becoming unwell or, 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 or losing family members of the people that work within our project area. So that's scouts and our workshop mechanic people and our, our, our teams there on the ground. Um, that's not that's to say that's, that's not good to hear. Um, <laughs> But it, it might do. It does, it does appear that Africa is being um, impacted slightly differently, but I'm, I'm no expert in that. But I can tell you what we do foresee, sadly, is a significant impact from the economic downturn caused from COVID globally, um, primarily on tourism, because these areas, or our area at least, you know, the, the vital form of revenue, but more than that, the vital form of employment um, comes from tourism. Whether and the wildlife industry. So, whether that uh, tourism is generating revenue for the community to be able to pay their scouts or to 
invest in another clinic or another school or another community project um, in those wildlife areas, um, or whether that's employment in a, in a safari lodge, photographic lodge, or employment in a hunting camp, um, whatever that form of employment is, you know, that, that, that has been really negatively impacted and is going to continue to be um, for the foreseeable future, hopefully not beyond 2021, but who knows what's going to happen. I think, you know, none of us can really predict it at this stage. Um, and beyond that, there's a, there's a kind of microeconomy within, within our landscape, at least. You know, we've got about uh, just under 500 um, employees uh, connected directly to wildlife, be that scouts, mechanics, extension officers, community workers, school teachers, all directly um, employed off the back of wildlife. Now, if their salaries get cut or their jobs lost, you know, their, 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 the economy that they themselves drive within their community, within their purchasing power, within small shops, whether it's, you know, just buying very small basic household items or you know, spending money within their village, that obviously supports other households. Um, so there's a massive, there's a knock-on effect there, which I think it's going to be very difficult to predict, but other than to say that that loss of wage is, um, is a huge concern. Um, and the, the longer we have a period of no tourism, or at least no international tourism, um, the longer that impact will be. <laughs> yeah, it's... Uh, um when you mentioned that the local community does, you know, receive a significant benefit or at least somewhat of a benefit from being close to the park with uh, tourism activities, I figured you'd mention that that was probably the largest impact that you, you've seen is the loss of tourism. Is there uh, any kind of immediate needs or, or ways that people can get involved? Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think there are two things. I mean, the one thing that we're trying to do um, uh, first is to secure funding to cover the salaries of all of the scouts whose salaries were paid for from um, tourism revenue. Um, so that's, that's the first, first thing, because I think A, that obviously pays the scouts to do their work, um, but B, it also enables them to keep spending in their communities to help supporting their village economy as well. So that's, that's, that's the first thing that we are trying to do. And we've, we've, we've had some success to date in getting those salaries covered and we're trying to, we want to look to get those salaries covered through till um, mid-2021, um, just to give us some, some say, safety net, should we say, through, through to the middle of next year. And hopefully by then things have, have started to improve. Um, so that, I think, is probably the, 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 the number one thing. Um, and then beyond that, we've also, um, this year, been trying to promote local tourism to try and fill up some of those tourist beds with, with local um, tourists coming from within the country and actually we've had some success there we did build a camp for the community on our, our western side of the park outside the park this year and um, because people couldn't travel they couldn't get overseas and there was very much restricted work um, there was people started to, to come which was great and really good to see and has uh, really kind of opened our eye to the opportunity of increased local tourism so what we want to try and do over the next year or so is to try and invest in more um, photographic tourism um, facilities, be that campsites or self-catering um, camps um, in and outside the park that are much more affordable for the local tourists. Um, that's, what we're, that's what we're trying to do. So we want to try and open up another two or three camps in the course of the next 12 months because already we've seen a much higher occupancy rate than we had anticipated from local tourists. But equally, it, it gives us some more resilience because, yes, it's COVID this year. Who knows what it's going to be next year or the year after? Is there going to be another you know, terrorist war or some kind of um, uh, other major international incident? And you know, international tourism can be affected again. So I think the more resilience we build in a local tourism market and facilities, I think it'll hold us in, in good stead for the future um, by way of diversifying our revenue sources from not just international tourism, but also uh, really promoting and pushing the local tourism as well. That, that's good to hear. And it's nice to see that the, the country is, you know, adopting its, 
you know, it's, it's great resources and, and wants to experience them. I think you're seeing that, you know, across the world, you know, here in the United States, I think people have rediscovered, oh, wow, we have parks, you know, (laughs) so, hey, this is pretty cool. So, um, you know, that, that may be, you know, one of the, the few benefits of, of the global pandemic is people are rediscovering what they actually have in their, in their backyards. Um, it's important to note, and I think you've said it, but um, I think we probably should stress it again, that poaching has not uh, stopped. And so it's important to maintain um, these types of protection and monitoring activities that um, you're attempting to do and, and keeping those, those, uh, those scouts employed and, and out in the field where they belong um, and where they do the most good. So. If uh, um, if I asked you what are uh, you mentioned the, the the growth in local tourism are there uh, some other things we can look forward to from uh, FZS or the uh, North Luanga conservation programs in the near future? Yeah, so let me I'll go on to that in just a second. But you've just triggered something else in my mind. Um, which I guess is a bit of a negative. Um, I think, but um, I do think now. So in Zambia, we um, our farmers. Um, and most of our adjoining community are kind of subsistence farmers. They would generally be planting their crops in November, December, um, and harvesting probably in between April um, and May. Now, I do think that, you know, we've been able to, people have been able to live off last year's harvest, um, quite supplemented by what employment opportunities there are. Um, now, with that downturn in the economy, and with that downturn, obviously, in tourism as well, we've also had a drop in the copper price globally as well, which Zambia's other main, or well, its number one products earner is, is or, or, or uh, economy um, uh, generator comes from copper. Um, so with the, both of those declines, I think the, the Zambian economy in particular is, is, is going to suffer. Um, and that could mean that we have a, a much more dire situation come you know, November through till, before, through till the next harvest because people's grain stores at the moment will be gradually diminishing and without the um, additional sources of revenue or enterprise because of a downturn in the economy and loss of jobs, we could really feel the pressure on, 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 on people. Now, obviously, that is where, and like you've just said, poaching is very much still there. It's very much still a threat. Um, and that's when I think criminal gangs or cartels can take advantage of local uh, people who are um, really suffering without employment and without, with a bad economy and, you know, potentially offer rewards or money to, to, to undertake criminal activities, including poaching. Um, so I think, you know, the next six, eight months are really quite critical over that period. We'll just have to, to play it by ear to see, to see what happens, but to be ready for any potential increase um, because that, that might be driven, driven by that. So I just wanted to, to cover that point as well. I'm, I'm glad you did because the International Foundation uh, believes um, exactly that um, can, can happen and is very concerned that poaching um, could become a crisis um, once, you know, not just uh, in Zambia, but in, in, in Southern Africa as a whole once, um, you know, lockdowns start to lift as the economies worsen. Um, yeah, it could get it could get far worse. And so, um, being prepared for that and and uh, uh, doing what we can now is 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 uh, definitely um, very necessary at this time. Yeah. So then, moving on to something more positive, I think so far um, this year has been a great year for North Rango rhinos. We've had six calves, which is exciting, and we're hoping for a couple more if we can. <laughs> end of the year, which is a, which would be a nice number. So that, that's really good to see um, little calves, little fat chubby calves running around. Um, <laughs> nice number to come up this year. Let's hope that their mothers are able to have them over the kind of critical first two years, but that's a really good number. Um, and means that our population obviously is, in, is, is increasing, which is, which is good, although obviously means that we have to constantly keep on thinking about how to, how to manage a growing population. But um, we're also quite excited to, 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 to start planning now for a second founder population within Zambia. Um, people may or may not be aware, but we took on another site um, on uh, Lake Tanganyika, a Sumbul National Park and its surrounds, um, which is an, a park that had been, um, you know, was, was somewhat depleted and neglected over the last 20 years. Um, 
but we've got a really good team there who, uh, who are already doing some work in that area who are now, um, we've been supporting and, you know, we've been able to employ a lot more scouts, equip them, build scout houses, get a community team going, um, get a boat uh, marine team going, um, looking for some in infrastructure development. Um, we're hoping next year, now that we've managed to get a handle on the poaching and reduce the, 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 the poaching threat there, we're hoping next year to move Buffalo in. Um, and then the following years, hopefully some other uh, Plains game species to, 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 to help the area regenerate a bit quicker once we know that we've secured it. And then ultimately, and not too far away, um, we want to target a black rhino uh, population from you know, taking some cohorts from the North Rango group um, up there, it's got perfect rhino habitat. It's got this beautiful itiggy thicket, which is basically like rhino ice cream, full of thickets of <laughs> rhino food on the edge of the lake. Um, and if we deem ourselves to have the management capacity ready and the security, then hopefully, you know, we'll be ready in the next three, four, five years um, to, to establish a second population, black rhino population in Zambia, which is, is exciting, ambitious, but it's, a, it's something really nice to aim for. We won't cut any corners. We might be delayed, but that's, you know, that, that'll be only because we want to get things right. Um, but that's our, our, our next big um, target. Well, that, that's some really interesting and great news to see that there's a potential expansion coming in the near future. So if I asked you to, to, to keep looking into the future, um, what are some changes do you want to see to help rhinos? And what are some, um, what are some advancements that, like you just mentioned, do you see that are, are possible? Um, what changes do I want to see? We could do without another COVID. <laughs> <laughs> we could all do without that. <laughs> um, no, I think if we, the big thing from a Zambia perspective or a North Rwanda perspective, I think the biggest thing that we could sort out would be true community ownership of the resources within which they live. And I think the more, obviously, you know, government still needs to make um, some form of revenue to cover government and nationwide costs. But considering the population of the people in these buffer areas around national parks are statistically proven to be the poorest in the country, um, I think we need to make sure that as much revenue as is possible can be retained by them, managed effectively, and we can all support that, um, and spent in those areas. I think that'll give much better um, long-term integrity or, 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 or support the infrastructure of community management of these wildlife areas that'll give everything a chance to succeed from the rhinos in the middle of the park all the way out to lions buffaloes whatever it is habitat just basic habitat hydrological services outside the park and i think that has to be driven by a a, a future vision based on based around people and based around people owning their decisions and owning as much as possible their resource that's great. Uh, before I let you go, Ed, um, any last thoughts? Uh, no, I think, uh, I think that covers it. I think mean, obviously we're thankful to IRF for all their ongoing support, um, which, is, which is great to have. But uh, no, I can't think of anything else right now. Well, thank you. And thank you for joining me today. And uh, please extend our thanks to uh, the entire team at the North Luanga Park for everything they're doing to keep Rano safe and, and support their growth. And uh, we'll have to check in uh, with you when uh, you get a little further down the road with some of these uh, projects. Cool. Right. Thanks very much. Hey, Team Rhino, here are some actions you can take today on World Rhino Day and every day. Stay informed, spread the word. And uh, you can check out uh, or make a donation, start your own fundraiser at uh, rhinos.org uh, backslash world dash rhino dash day. Uh, thank you for joining us today and tune in for the next Rhino Talk.